Today I'm, I'm going to discuss with you human genetics and the future of you and of your families. So we are 99.9% .9 identical. Any two people in this room, downstairs, out in the street, in the city of El Paso, state of Texas, New Mexico, or Mexico, are 99.9% .9 identical. Now you're probably thinking, what's this guy talking about? You look around, people are taller, shorter, some have a lot of hair, some have none. Uh, it's called male pattern baldness, by the way, and I, I blame my parents for it. I will never have a Willie Nelson braid, regrettably. So how can this be possible? We differ in our hair color, our eye color, our skin tone, our body shape. How can we possibly be 99.9% .9 identical? Well, what I really mean is that the DNA in our genome is 99.9% .9 identical. Now, I recognize that very few of you are geneticists, and so let me define a couple of terms for you before I get into the crux of the argument. I'll say, uh, mention what is DNA, and then after a few intermediate steps, talk about what is a genome, and then connect it to the future of you and your families. So what is DNA? Well, DNA is the chemical building block for our genes and our genome. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, which is basically why we call it DNA. Uh, hard to say. It consists of four building blocks or bases termed A, T, G, and C. And these are paired together such that A is always joined with T and G is always joined with C into long strands. And these are probably known to you as the double helix. So what's a gene? Well, genes, pictured here from a, a slide taken from the National Library of Medicine, are composed of DNA, and they consist of the instructions for human development, all of our organs and tissues, and all of our bodily functions. Now, we're pretty complicated creatures, and so we need a lot of instructions. Probably some of us more than others, but that's a different story. Uh, we have more than 20,000 genes that code for these instructions organize within our chromosomes. So what's a chromosome? Well, chromosomes also pictured here in the same figure from the National Library of Medicine. They are the organizing units for all of the genes in all of our cells. And they consist of DNA plus specialized packaging proteins that allow that DNA to be put in an organized way inside our cells. Every organism, humans, other mammals, vertebrates, plants, have a special number of chromosomes. Humans have 23 pairs, and they are found within the nucleus of practically all of our cells. A little more about chromosomes. Uh, as I mentioned, we have 23 pairs of them. That's not quite fully true. Uh, women have 23 pairs of chromosomes. They have 22 autosomes, 22 pairs of autosomes, and one pair of sex chromosomes called the X chromosome. Men have 22 pairs of autosomes, an X chromosome, and a Y. <coughs> Pictured on the slide here is what's called a karyotype, or an organization of all of our chromosomes. And this is a, a kind of a complicated series of steps where uh, cells are treated with a specialized agent that allows the chromosomes to expand, they're photographed, and then organized, uh, such as you see on this figure. It doesn't look like this inside of us. Now you'll notice that there are chromosomes range from large to small. Uh, chromosomes 1 through 5 are the larger ones, and chromosomes 19 to 22 uh, are the smaller ones. The X chromosome is pretty large. It's about the size of chromosome 6 or 7, and it has within it quite a few genes. 
The Y chromosome is rather puny, guys. Uh, and it's a little smaller than chromosome 22 and actually has very few genes. Now, for those of you who are married, uh, particularly uh, female spouses, will recognize that what's missing on the Y chromosome is that gene that allows you to ask for directions when you're driving in the car. Thank goodness for Waze and Google Maps. So, and again, X and Y chromosomes. So finally, what is our genome? Well, our genome consists of all of the DNA in all of our chromosomes. And that's three billion base pairs of DNA. Now, I've said at the beginning, the DNA in our genome is 99.9% .9 identical. But why do we seem so different? Why are we taller, shorter, have different hair color, eye color, skin tone, body shape, and so forth? So let's look at that. Why do we seem so different? So in order to answer that question, I have to introduce to you for a second a little bit about inheritance. So here's a single chromosome pair from a mother and a father. I've color-coded them, red and blue for the mother, green and orange for the father. And as nearly all of you know, we inherit chromosomes from our mother and our father, one of a pair from each, and that makes the children. And, the ch and this is kind of a random process. So every child is half like a mother or father, and therefore is not identical to either because he or she gets chromosomes from each in equal measure. Children are different from each other because the chromosomes received by one uh, are typically different than the other, but because we're half and half of each parent, we're similar. Now the key part of this slide, however, are the little black dots. And those little black dots are single changes in DNA. For example, from a T to a C, or a G to an A, or vice versa. And these are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNP. And I'll use the term SNP because I'll get tongue-tied if I say single nucleotide polymorphism more than one other time. So why are we so different? Well, SNPs can influence the function of genes. Remember genes? those instructions, uh, and that depends upon where they're located in the genome. So let me give you an example. Here's a chromosome, here's a gene that I've placed on that chromosome. I'm calling that gene rig for a really important gene. And this really, and let's just pretend that this really important gene has some function that relates to uh, our heart. And, the, and let's say that the version of rig with the little black dot, that is the SNP, increases the susceptibility of an individual to have a heart attack by about 2%. Now you'll say, 2%, that's hardly anything. A uh, big deal. SNP, 2%, heart attack, nothing, right? However, there are 10 million SNPs in the human population. And any two unrelated individuals differs by about 3 million of them, those single changes in DNA, those SNPs. 3 million SNPs is 0.1% of the 3 billion base pairs of DNA in our genome. So we are 99.9% .9 identical, 0.1% different, and much of those dif that difference is determined by SNPs, DNA changes. So why are these SNPs important for us? Well, over the past 15 years or so, geneticists have identified, cataloged, and used these SNPs to try to determine things about people. And among the things they've tried to establish are whether certain SNPs can be associated with particular traits. Uh, not only things like stature, but also predisposition to develop a disease. Let me give you an example. 
uh, from the very recent uh, scientific literature. Coronary artery disease, very common in our uh, population, particularly in Western populations, the US uh, and Europe and uh, throughout North and South America. It's caused by a combination of both inherited and acquired characteristics and its manifestation, the bad manifestation, is a heart attack. A recent study from a, a group of geneticists examined the DNA of about a quarter of a million people from a biobank in England. And this DNA had been collected along with the health records of all of these individuals. And so they had an idea of what the health problems were of the people they were studying. And they were able to characterize SNPs in such a way that they could find a combination that was able to identify individuals who are at a five times greater than average risk of having a heart attack. Now admittedly, this was what's called a retrospective study, and the information wasn't predictive, it was really uh, more of an analysis going backwards in the past, but nevertheless, this is very provocative. Now you'll also notice in this slide, which is a bell-shaped curve, that on the other side from those with a five times higher risk is a little group, and that group has a many times, more than five times lower risk of having a heart attack. So we have within a population a stratification where one little group is uh, 25 times less likely to get a disease than the other group at the other end. Now the same uh, uh, researchers examined the potential for other common diseases uh, by using a different combination of SNPs and they were able to identify a cohort of people who had a three or four times higher risk to develop diabetes, a very common disease in our society. They also were able to identify a group who had a much higher risk of developing a certain type of breast cancer. So this leaves us with a little bit of questions from the context of the future, and the future of you, and the future of you and your family. And that's where I want to end. So what does the future hold for us in terms of modern genetics and genomics and disease, ideally disease prevention. And this is something for you to ponder. If there were a DNA test that could predict your disease risks for the future, would you take that test? Now admittedly, there is no test yet. The data that I showed you is brand new, it was just published a month ago. It will need to be confirmed, extended, and to determine whether or not it applies to other populations in the world besides those in Great Britain. But would you take such a test? More importantly, because this is a, a future uh, looking potential uh, possibility, should your children or your grandchildren take such a test? And should they take a test, even if there's no prevention for the disease or diseases in question, or any treatment? And so those questions I'm gonna leave you to ponder. And with that, thank you very much for your attention.